I've always believed that to understand an issue, you need to get as close to it as you possibly can. So, in this new series, I'll be traveling across the country, meeting people who are living with some of the biggest issues affecting Britain today. Whoa, look. Tonight, I'm spending time with those caught up in Britain's knife crime epidemic. You know that that is designed for one thing and one thing only. I'll be meeting people who carry knives. Like I've been stabbed, stabbed people, yeah, it does get crazy. Those living with the consequences. I'm a lucky mother, by the way, because I got to see my son before he died. And I ask if enough is being done to stop the bloodshed. We can't leave the knives with you. Better for you to have them for us to drive around with them, surely? Police appealed for witnesses to the latest knife murder, the fifth fatal stabbing in a week of horror. The headlines are becoming all too familiar, but no less shocking. According to one witness, the victim's parents were with him when he died. Knife crime is on the rise, and people up and down the country are losing their lives in record numbers. 285 people were fatally stabbed in England and Wales last year. That's the highest number since records began. Now, the communities that are faced with knife crime on a daily basis seem reluctant to talk about it. So, I'm going to ask them why and try to find out if anything can be done to stop the killings. I started my journey in London, knife crime capital of the UK. The Metropolitan Police deal with an average of 40 blade-related offences every single day. And in the first four months of this year, there were more than 20 fatal stabbings here. I'm just about to go into a flat in South London and speak to four gang members who carry knives. I didn't know their identities, but I was told they were all under the age of 21. Thanks for agreeing to talk to us, guys. The youngest was just 15. Got to ask you guys, why are so many young people carrying knives now? Some people don't even have a choice, isn't it? That young person has to carry a knife to protect himself from other people trying to come to him, you get me? So it's about protection? Yeah, of course, man. How young were you when you started carrying? 13. 13. 13, same age. Have any of you ever been attacked? Yeah, I've been attacked. Yeah. How does it happen? You can be in a certain area, wrong place, wrong time. Is it over drugs? A lot of it's over drugs, but then nowadays it's just silly. You trying to have a problem with you over nothing. Why has it got so bad? I think mainly social media, so Snapchat, Instagram. Certain people say things and it just escalates the situation. And now everyone thinks it's fashion to be carrying a knife. So are you carrying knives now? Yeah, we've all got something on us for real, for real. Can I have a look? Can I ask a question? Where did that come from? <laughs> you can get it out online, you can get that anywhere. I can get it around the anywhere. corner. One phone call. Can I touch it? Go ahead. What? Look, let's be serious about this, boys. You know that that is designed for one thing and one thing only. That's not for use in the kitchen, right? Have any of you had friends who have either been stabbed or killed? Yeah. How many fatally? Three. So you know three young people have lost their lives. And you still carry your knives? I've got to protect myself. It's hard, hard out there uh, when you okay. think of it. It's hard. But also, not every young person carries a knife, do they? Some people choose not to. Yeah. We're not out to kill civilians. And that's what you refer to them, yeah? Yeah. So is it a war then? There's definitely opposite sides. People are dying. So it's a war, isn't it? It seems like a catch-22. These young men say if they don't carry knives, they could end up dead. But if they get caught carrying them, they could receive up to four years in prison. But it's not just kids in our biggest cities who are arming themselves with blades. Stereotypically, knife crime has been associated with a certain colour skin on estates in London. 
But knife crime is growing faster outside of the capital than it is within it. And it's not just black kids, it's white kids, it's Asian kids. And it's not just happening on estates, it's happening in the suburbs. I was heading to Sheffield in South Yorkshire, not a place I would have associated with knife crime. But last year in this county, 104 children were charged with knife offences, a 50% increase on three years ago. I'd heard about an organisation in the city that was using radical methods to deter kids from picking up knives. Hanif Mohammed was running workshops for kids from schools who thought they'd benefit from knife crime awareness. Who's ever carried a knife? Be honest. It's a subject Hanif knew a great deal about. At the age of 24 years old, I was responsible for stabbing and killing somebody. I was charged with murder. So when we're talking about, oh yeah, I'm gonna carry a knife, it's not gonna do nothing, I'm just there for my own protection. What about the day you come across a guy that says, come on then, bring it. Hanif's workshop used hard-hitting role plays. Grab a shank. We've got beef, Charlie, we ain't it. Come quick, man, quick, man. Yo, I'm on that, man. Where are you going? The aim was to show how fast Bit things could come. escalate. Right, guys, if any of your boys said to you, bring a shank out, would you back your friends? You would, wouldn't you? Having served 10 years himself, Hanif had a final message for the boys from a mocked-up prison cell. I'm just going to give it you really, really raw. We walk around with that bad attitude in our minds. I had it all, but this is going to be your life, lads. Until the next day, and the next day, and the next day for 10 years. We had 285 fatal stabbings in England and Wales last year. Horrendous. Why? The reality is young people who reside in areas of social deprivation simply don't have access to certain services. In Sheffield, in the last 10 years, there's been a 50% reduction for child services. So that's like me saying to you, I want you to bake me a cake, but with 50% of the ingredients mm. missing and come out with the same results. It's impossible. We approached Sheffield City Council about cuts to child services, but they declined to respond. So this proliferation in knife crime, is it just kids living on estates? No, it's not. Poverty is a factor, but in people from middle class families involved in knife crime, it could be anyone. Do you know, like cancer spreads. Initially it starts at the place where it was incepted, but then after it spreads, same thing. If, let's say London had crime, Liverpool had crime, eventually it would filter down to the small cities. But Hanif believed that ultimately it was down to the individual to make a choice about their own future. I tell young men like this that if someone as stupid as me can do half decent and make some of their lives, you've got all the talent in the world, young man. You can do anything you want. Hanif said that he had worked with 20,000 young people and that in many cases his workshops had made children think twice about carrying or using knives. But coming up, I meet someone who's been at both ends of a blade. I have been stabbed. I've stabbed people. It does get crazy. I was back in London, where you're twice as likely to be stabbed than anywhere else in England and Wales. There were 15,000 knife crimes in the capital last year. And while the Met Police recover a ton of knives a month off the streets here, there are some who live here who believe more needs to be done. In 2015, the police launched Operation Scepter with the aim of reducing knife crime. Dozens of knife amnesty bins were placed across the country and a shocking array of bladed weapons were handed in. But some people don't think the bins are enough. I feel like I've known you for a little while, boy. <laughs> <laughs> I was hitting the streets with 33-year-old Londoner Farron Paul and his friend Jordan. Farron travelled around the capital collecting knives and handing them in to the police. You've been stabbed, right? More yeah. than once? Yeah. How many times? I got stabbed nine times on one occasion and nine times on another occasion. But did you think about revenge at that point? Yeah, I did. Of course I did. I, I couldn't think of nothing but revenge. But I realised that I can't go get into trouble for trying to seek revenge because how, how could that be fair to my family? How could that be fair to my children? But do you think what you're doing now is sort of the reverse revenge? Do you know yeah, I mean? that's exactly what it is. Using social media, Farron received up to 20 messages to retrieve knives 
every day. So this is the park entrance here. We've been called to a park in North London. Hey Ross. Yeah man. Usually I put on my vest in it, yeah, but you know because of the daylight and I trust this guy, it's not that kind of situation, do you get me? Gigi. Family. Farron had been contacted by Ricardo, a local youth worker. No, it was, yeah. Mm. One of the kids came to me and he's like, one of his friends must have got stabbed, didn't it? OK. And, but he was there, like, he fully saw it. And he said, like... It broke him. It broke. Like, he crumbled. You give me that thing, I'm going to spin to the van of it, yeah? yeah so, is that it, yeah? So it was one of the ones where he just came up to me and said, oh, Young lad, how old? 15. He's been doing it since he's been 13. And his friend got stabbed. And he had to say, you know what, I want out. Mm. Thank you. No, and good luck. Thank you man. very much. All right, take care. See you, man. I was keen to see what Ricardo had just handed over. So is brother? this it? Yeah, this is the thing we just got a few minutes. The killing machine, isn't it? Of course it is, bro. That's just death. Farron was proof that a community tired of violence was taking matters into its own hands. I feel like all the people that contact me, they're actually, like, they're telling me they're sick of this life. They don't want to live this life no more. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And I feel like a lot of this is through financial hardship, man. Like, these kids are, they live in the hard positions. I wanted to find out if young people felt that a lack of opportunities was playing a part in knife crime. I went to Newham, one of the most deprived boroughs in London. Thanks for agreeing to talk to us, guys. Appreciate it. I was meeting Maria, her 18-year-old son, Philippe, and his 20-year-old brother, Miguel, which is not his real name. And he also asked that we didn't show his full face. So how long have you been carrying a knife for? When I was young, I used to just carry it, like, on and off. Like, things weren't really as intense back then. The turning point was mainly when I finished secondary school. And, like, personally, money was the main catalyst that made me fully commit to that lifestyle. Struggling to find a regular job, Miguel started selling cannabis. Can you give us an idea of how much you could make in a week? So if you're selling that three ounces a day, then you're making that 300 pounds profit. Yeah, seven days a week? Pretty much. You're making 2K a week? Yeah. So if you're doing that at like 16, 15, then you're just going to be stubborn and you're not going to look at anything else. But that also comes with a risk, doesn't it? If you're vulnerable, to other people who want to take that off you. Yes. I did get into, like, a few mad situations. Like, I've been stabbed. Like, I've stabbed people. Like, it's just, yeah, it does get crazy. Philippe watched his brother slip into a life of drugs, gangs and knives. It would have been easy to follow suit, but he resisted. Philippe, you're not doing what your brother's doing. Yeah. How have you managed to stay out of it? It's extremely difficult because let's say I do like my usual job. Let's say I do a nine hour shift. I'll earn like a hundred pound. Mm. But then I look at my friend, he just made that hundred pound within 20 minutes. That's like the negative side. But the positive side is I don't have to worry about the money. I don't have to worry for people to rob me and to take my money because I've earned it. Hard earned cash. You're going to university, aren't you? Yeah. Was that a conscious decision to want to go to somewhere away from here? Yeah, I just need to get um, out of this environment because there's lots of negativity. Miguel said that he was trying to change his life for the better and that he'd paid the price for his past crimes. You've just come out of prison, right? Yeah. Did that have any effect on you? In all honesty, prison just made me a million times worse. Like, all you're doing is just meeting up with more enhanced criminals that can just better your criminality. Maria, you hear this stuff. How does it make you feel as his mum? I worry every day. It's like a physical thing. Every time we hear a siren, we go to the window. Every time we have a knock on the door, you think, oh, maybe it's bad news. Do you worry, mate, that the next stop could either be end of you or you serving a 20-year prison sentence? Yeah, that's always in your mind because the police only need to get lucky once, but you need to be lucky constantly. Maria had never spoken to anyone outside her family about Miguel's problems. I accompanied her and Philippe 
to a support group. Hello, everybody. Where she was ready to share her story with people uh, who had all been boss. affected by knife crime. Basically, Jason was going out with a few pals to the cinema and he never made it because a gang from another area decided to turn up, give chase, and Jason got stabbed multiple amount of times with a machete. I was working in my pub and I got a phone call to say my son had been stabbed in Upper Street, Islington. I'm a lucky mother, by the way, because I got to see my son before he died. Yeah. And luckily for me, the last thing my son ever did was sit up and grab my hand and call me mum. When my son was stabbed, luckily, I'm so grateful he's not dead. But eight hours of surgery later, I feel so ashamed to speak with mums. They, they lost their kids. When I was trying to reach for help, all I could find was grief and pain. And I was trapped because all I'm trying to say is that I don't want to bury my son. It's so good, number one, that you're there for him. Because a lot of parents don't have that relationship with their kids. Mm -hmm. So when they go through these experiences, there's a distinct lack of adult intervention. So what we have to do is help him change his environment mm -hmm. and get out of that hostile environment. I could see how much bravery it took for Maria to talk openly about her son's problems and how hard it will be for him to live a crime-free life. Are you going to tell your brother that your mum cried today? No. Why not? And I know my brother. Like, it would affect him, but he just want, would want to brush it off. In, yeah, that's how he is. That's the rawness of it. The rawness of yeah. it? Yeah. Brushes so, it off? Yeah, sometimes. Lovely meeting you. Thank you, lovely meeting you. Thank Good you so luck. Much. Thank you. OK, thank, thank you. you. Back with Knife Amnesty campaigner Farron Paul, we'd been called to collect another lethal weapon. So that's it. Do you see how far that would go into someone, pushed into them? So what's next? I'm going to go to the police station to make a drop off and have the two knives we picked up, and I'm going to call it a day, man. OK, mate. At the first police station, we were told there was a two hour wait to be seen. The second one was closed. Hopefully, it would be third time lucky. Hi, right, sir. These are two knives, yeah? That's one. There, my friend. And here's the other one. The public access officer on duty didn't know whether he could take the knives, so went to call his sergeant. While we waited, we noticed the station's knife amnesty bin was taped shut. And I was reminded of the fact that police numbers have been significantly reduced in the past decade. 20,000 police officers off the streets mm. in the last 10 years. It's starting to show. Do you think so? Clearly. After nearly 15 minutes, the officer returned, but it wasn't good news. You can put this to my side. Mm -hmm. We haven't got any officers in here. The mm -hmm. best thing to do is maybe to go to Wembley. OK, so you have to take these to Wembley, yeah? Is it possible? Better for you to have them for us to drive around with them, surely? Yeah. Finally, the officer agreed to take the knives off Farron's hands. It is frustrating that, but the fact is, you've taken two knives off the streets tonight. Yeah, that, I'm, I'm happy with that. Have a good day, my boy. Yeah? Thank you, my friend. Thanks, man. The Metropolitan Police Service told us it had removed some bins from stations, but had funded public amnesty bins and planned to fund more. It added that the police station that was closed was run by volunteers and not open all the time. But it encouraged anyone who wanted to hand in a knife to drop it in to their local police station. Availability of knives on the streets is one thing, but having spent time with those at the heart of the issue, the reasons people carry knives in the first place appear to be more complex. However, when I met the gang members at the start of my journey, they all had one thing in common. Did all of you finish full-time education? No. 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 I stopped out of school when I was 12. 12? Yeah. Do you think that that had a direct impact on the way that things have turned out for you? Definitely one of the impacts that messed up my life. One of, yeah, definitely. As soon as you get kicked yeah. out, you go to a referral centre, 
people refer you in it. Yeah. You're not getting the same lesson, you're surrounded by other bad kids. You're labelled as a bad kid, you think you're a bad kid because you don't go to mainstream yeah, school. Does. Kids who are permanently excluded from school are often sent to pupil referral units to complete their education. So you're going to put a bunch of bad kids from different areas that already have problems with each other in, in the same community? Does that make sense? So if you're labelled that early on, getting out of that label is going to be really hard, right? Well, yeah, yeah, it's true. I'm not seeing people that can say, Oh, OK, let's give him another chance. I didn't get another chance. Well, we think that not being given a second chance is a real big one. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I said, F them, I'm going to do what I'm doing. There's no other choice here. So obviously it upsets me. Do you know what I mean? I'm taking it out in the streets. The Home Office told us that issues surrounding knife crime were complex, there was no simple link between school exclusions and crime and the pupil referral units often provide a lifeline to children through smaller classes and specialised support. It also said it is focusing on early intervention, putting more than 200 million into projects to prevent young people from being drawn into violent crime and consulting on a new approach which will see public bodies working together more effectively. It added it is giving police greater powers and more funding, with new legislation making it harder to possess and purchase knives. But the majority of people that I've met on my journey felt they were either fighting or facing knife crime on their own. Whether it be a young person carrying a knife for protection or a community figure taking matters into their own hands. So, in addition to new laws, more police and early intervention projects, the government needs to convince those people living on the front line of knife crime that there is genuine help out there if they're to stand any chance of ending this national tragedy. From sports cars to designer goods, if you've ever wondered what happens to all the seized luxury assets of Britain's criminals, new police camera auction is the one to watch at nine here on ITV, where Robert makes a big decision after the break. Stay with us as we return to Emmerdale.